Uh, welcome. I'm so happy to see all your faces after waiting for the streaming to get on. Um, welcome to the third session of Struggles and Places, Contagious Tradi Traditions of Resistance and Solidarity. This is an initiative of PhD students of the Social Justice Institute. In today's panel, which carries the title Living as a Political Act, Unsettling the Gendered and Racialized Underpinnings of Capitalist Logics, Alejandra, Fabi, David, Maddie, our guest moderator for today's conversation, and myself, have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Mariana Moraballo and Dr. Isabel Altamirano Jimenez. I took the lead on organizing this session because I'm interested in the ways in which Mariana's work attends to social transformation. Her research complicates ideas of political action and brings them together with feminist logics. I have known Mariana and her work for a while and although I'm just meeting Isabel, from reading her work, I know this will be an inspiring and fruitful conversation. Before we start, um, I want to acknowledge that we are, today, we are streaming today from the unceded, ancestral, and occupied territory of the Coast Salish, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. This territory forms what is also known as Vancouver. Land acknowledgements began in these territories as a way of indicating the ongoing theft and expropriation of lands and nature by the Canadian state. Today, we make the land acknowledgement to draw attention to the ongoing sovereignty and land protection struggles of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. 1492 land back lane, Mi'kmaq fishing rights, and Wet'suwet'en land protection and to structure, inform, and shape what we are doing here today. As students who work, live, and benefit from unceded territories, it is necessary for us to start our conversations by recentering these political imaginaries and practices. Thank you all for being here. Wonderful, thank you, Mai, for that uh, lovely introduction and for the land acknowledgement. Um, my name is Maddie Redden, and I'm a PhD uh, student here at uh, the University of British Columbia. I'm in the English department, and I work on uh, global modernist uh, and anti-colonial avant-garde with a focus on indigenous literature and the political preoccupations of uh, indigenous peoples. So I'm going to first start by uh, introducing both of our uh, speakers today and um, also introducing um, Mariana's book. And then we'll move through a series of questions we've prepared for the speakers um, and uh, yeah, and have a lovely discussion. Okay, great. So I am just going to introduce um, Mariana first. So Mariana Mora is an associate professor, a researcher at the Center for Research and Advanced Studies in Social, uh, Social Anthropology in Mexico City. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin and an MA in Latin American Studies from Stanford University. Her research focuses on struggles against the continued processes of colonization as part of state formation in Latin America, including in indigenous regions in Mexico, critical race and gender studies, decoloniality and the political, and her recent work centers on race and human rights regimes as part of struggles for justice in cases of extreme violence and territorial dispossession. She is a part of the Continental Anti-Racist Action Research Network through the Mexico-based collective to eliminate racism in Mexico and is part of the network of decolonial feminisms. Isabel Altamirano Jimenez is Beniza Zapotec um, from the Isthmus of uh, Tehuantepec, Mexico. She is a professor of political science and a Canada research chair in comparative indigenous feminist studies at the University of Alberta. Her current research examines the connection among body, land, dispossession, and indigenous refusal and documents how indigenous women embody the impacts of resource extraction in Western Canada and Southern Mexico. She is currently preparing her second monograph Body, Land, Resource Extraction, and Indigenous Resurgence. Among her books are Living on the Land, Indigenous Women, Understandings, and Place, edited with N. Uh, Kermel, 
Kermal, and Indigenous Encounters with Neoliberalism, Place, Women, and Environment. So to start, I, I will uh, just give a short crazy about Mariana's book, and then I will ask uh, Alejandra to ask the first question. So um, today's conversation concerns the questions raised by Mariana's book, Kushlehal Politics, Indigenous Autonomy, Race, and Decolonizing Research in Zapatista Communities. It summarizes her more than 10 years of extended research and solidarity work in Chiapas with Celtal and Toho Labal, community members who collaborated in designing and evaluating her fieldwork. So Alejandra, please ask the first question. Thank you, Mary. Hello, everyone. Hello, Isabel. Hello, Mariana. It's a pleasure to stay here and share with you. Uh, before we start talking about the book, uh, we would like to know how you are and how your own communities, but also the indigenous communities that you have worked with and that you keep contact with are faring under COVID-19. Hello, would you like me to start or Isabel? Whatever do you want. Okay. Maybe Mariana, you can start, yeah. yes. Okay, bueno. Well, first I would like to thank all of you very much for, for the invitation, for taking the time to read the book, for asking very um, sharp questions that left me thinking. <laughs> And, and I want to thank very much Isabel for agreeing to take the time to read the book and also for being in this dialogue with me. Um, and, and I very much appreciate, well, first I'd like to say that I'm, I'm, in, I'm speaking from Mexico City, um, which uh, is, is historically Nahuatl territory and continues to be. Uh, and, and I very much appreciate us, you starting asking uh, how things are with the pandemic in the places where we live. Uh, I think that the pandemic has, has created a very necessary humil humbleness you know, um, for everyone and, and recognizing um, where we are in place, who, are, who surrounds us and how we need to take care of each other. So in, in, in Mexico City, unfortunately, we're still in, 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 here it's in terms of the, like the a city light. So we went from red to orange and we stuck in orange. <laughs> we haven't moved from orange, which means that, um, but daily life is taking, is, is continuing almost as normal, um, which makes it very concerning for, for all of those people that are, are making a day-to-day -day life on the streets and, and have very little protection. Uh, and in terms of, of friends and colleagues of mine that, that live in, in indigenous regions in, in the country, I think it's important to, to recognize that, that the difficulties of, of confronting a very, um, a very strong challenge, which is how do you close yourself off? You know, if you have a historical memory of how you engage and survive epidemics since colonization, like colonization was started with, in part with, pandem with epidemics, uh, if, if closing yourself off is a mechanism of protection, what do you do with all of your community members that are were in the United States and were deported or were forced to leave because they left their jobs? Do you include them? Do you keep them out? Um, what are the mechanisms for collective safety and health? So I think that it's important to recognize that the, that the challenges are not at all uh, easy. And in some communities, in the, I'm thinking of the mountain region in Guerrero, people have, have, the communities have closed themselves off in others. And I'm thinking of, of Mije intellectual Yasnaya Aguilar, who has described how the pandemic has been operating from her community in Ayutla, um, has been, we can't close ourselves off because we're the entrance to the entire territory. And if we close off ourselves off, then we're not able to provide health services. Um, so, so, so these conundrums that I think are designed and how have at a center point how you take care of collective health, um, understanding as Yasnaya has said that that the, the well being of an individual depends on the well being of a collective. So how you make that possible, whether it's in a rural setting or an urban um, context, I think is extremely difficult. So I, in, in my case, I think that I always, um, 
I always reflect on what is happening in the pandemic in the sense that I live in Edmonton. Um, and in compared to Mexico City, the situation here is not as bad. We are in uh, stage three, everything is open. Uh, it seems to be some kind of sense of normalcy in, in this state of emergency. And, and you know, I know that our lives have changed, but it's also um, the fact that my entire family lives in the isthmus of Tehuantepec always makes me feel divided in, in the sense that my relationships are there and that their, their circumstances are not like the ones that I'm living in at the moment. COVID has exposed the tremendous inequalities that exist in urban and rural spaces in Mexico, but also in other places, including Canada. Some of the some of the issues that Mariana has touched upon in terms of like the difficult uh, challenges that indigenous communities have in terms of dealing with the with the pandemic are also in you know are, are really complicated. What do they do? Do they shut themselves down? And in the case of the Tehuantepec Ismos, this is particularly serious because this is the the an important route to to the Central America. This is uh, uh, the, the roads to, that have been historically really, really important for the, for the movement of goods, for the movement of people, for trading, for all kinds of things that is not as simple as to say, we're gonna shut down our communities. Because that means that even like the local networks of economic local networks stop functioning. And it's, it, that brings a lot of anxiety <laughs> in terms of how people are dealing with COVID. And I know that in Huchitan, one of the, the major cities in, in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, there is basically sort of like a, in a, rot, a red zone, like a, the, the number of cases, the number of infections there are really, really worrying and people are really scared in terms of dealing with, this, with these situations. Um, and in, in these particular cases, um, again, I think it is really important that we acknowledge that the comfort in which I am living at this particular moment are not, is not the comfort that my own family members are, are, are dealing with at this precise moment. And that I'm really cognizant of that, that uh, of the privilege that it means to be in a different space, in an urban space. But I also think that um, social distance, issues of social distance are putting a, a, a even more complicated uh, a sort of, you know, the burden of social distancing in well-need communities is particularly hard. Uh, I come from a relatively small community in the Tehuantepec Isthmus, in my community is called Istaltepec, and people are used to having these community celebrations. A funeral is a community celebration of life. And the people that are dying because of COVID, this is happening in isolation. And that has been adding a lot of stress in how people are experiencing the pandemic. And at the same time, I, I am perhaps hopeful with the fact that young Zapotecs are sort of trying to find the ways to continue with some practices of caring. And one of the things that these young people have been doing is that in, in my community, for example, the, the megaphone and cars, cars with megaphones are really important to share announcements and news and whatever. And what these people have been doing is sort of reading poems and stories and go around the community so that people don't feel isolated. So I have like the fortune of sharing one of the, uh, the short stories that have written, I have written. Um, and, you know, my family, my own family heard the story and they were really happy. So this is just some of the really interesting practices that people are engaging so that they can continue to care uh, of each other. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, now we'll have a question for Mai. Yes. <clears throat> I'll jump uh, over to the book. So this uh, will seem like a hard switch, but I'm sure that we will weave um, all the points that you just touched that 
have everything to do with the conversation that we will weave them into. So my first question is, Mariana, could you please define and situate Zapatista autonomy, its relevance and important, importance as a critique of the Mexican nation state, a form of struggle against neoliberal conditions and the decolonizing praxis that moves beyond? What aspects of Zapatista autonomy address the dehumanizing conditions of racialized colonial states of being in the current pandemic context? So that's only two that. and one. <laughs> Just only the little way. Only that. <laughs> <laughs> I read that question. I said, you're asking me to distill an entire book into one <laughs> answer. <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> um, and I'm going to try by, by explaining um, some of the ways that the research unfolded, which goes along with things that I'll touch upon later. But, but I think first I want to say that it was one fundamental aspect of the research was that uh, as a social scientist, I let go of my methodologies of the research questions and, and, and everything was shaped by uh, the series of interactions with Til Talento Jolava Zapatista community members. And, and so one of the ways that that happened and that it, it shaped um, the, the arguments in the analytical framework of the book had to do with, uh, with the answers to questions that I was asking. I was interested in understanding the neoliberal state, right? And I was interested in understanding why autonomy is a form of struggle as indigenous peoples against the neoliberal state. And so I would ask about procede, so the privatization of communal ejido lands. I would ask about state neoliberal anti-poverty programs. I would ask about just very concrete expressions of, of neoliberal policies and how that was affecting not their, their communities and their lives specifically because uh, the, the practice of autonomy in Zapatista communities is a politics of disengagement from the Mexican state, right? So, so it's autonomy on the margins of the state with uh, no interaction. The interactions with state institutions have to do with a, with a, uh, a rejection of those state institutions. So there's a rejection of, of, pro of pro programs, of official school teachers, of government um, social programs. No? Uh, so I would ask about how they understood neo, the neoliberal state and why did they, they declare war on the Mexican government when NAFTA came into effect in 1994. And the responses always had to do with the time of the fincas, or the time of the estates. Uh, the time of the estates uh, has to do with a period from the mid 19th century to the 1970s, uh, in some cases up until the uprising, where uh, it was a type of plantation system of, of cattle, of sugar, of coffee, of different basic agricultural commodities. Um, a lot of times under indentured types of, of enslavement types of conditions, right? So you had historic Mayan territory that was dispossessed first by the church during the colonial era, and then um, by mestizo local elites that would push Mayan um, celtales, tojolavales, and tzotziles out of their territory, and then create the plantations on that dispossessed land, um, and, and then force an indentured servitude of those people. So I'm actually curious to see if, if Isabel would consider that maybe a type of a combination of, of both settler and extractivist colonialisms, right, as, as a structure. So, and, 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 that type of indentured conditions involved, of course, a lot of uh, um, the extraction of a life force as you are forced to work for the well-being of someone else, not of yourself, and to the detriment of the well-being of your family and of your community. It involved uh, being told consistently that you were born to obey others. You are not there. You're not on this planet to, to make decisions for your own well-being as a collective. Um, and, and that your body and your culture is in a per perpetual state of degeneration, right? So, um, and, and all of that enveloped in a lot of memories of, of extreme sexual violence. So I would ask about the neoliberal state and I would get the story, the answers were the stories of, of the time of the fincas. And, and there, was, there are memories of a very deep intergenerational trauma and very deep pain that continues to, 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 
to be wrapped on the skin and be wrapped in the body, to be wrapped in the heart. Celtales a lot operates through the heart. So one way that you ask someone how they are is, how is your heart? No, ¿Cómo está tu corazón? Um, and, and so at first I, I thought that they were trying to explain to me autonomy in a way that, okay, this is what we, we used to live in and now we're into a different type of struggle. Um, until I, I realized that actually they were talking about the neoliberal Mexican state. And they were talking about the Mexican neoliberal state first by situating neoliberalism, um, not as a new phase, in Mexican state formation, but rather as a continuation of territorial dispossession of the, the continued disposability of indigenous bodies uh, and, and of the sexual violence that forms part of any process of colonization, right? So, so the time of the fincas is the condenses the analytical structure understanding of power and how oppressive and exploitative power works as part of the Mexican state in the current day. Um, and and so when I understood when when as so then so then I understood then as I started to trace neoliberal state formation along that line. So in what way are there very different tropes that were condensed in the time of the fincas and then continue to operate through neoliberal, neoliberal programs in the current moment? So I think that first it's important to recognize that the neoliberal state is a continuation of power. It's not. It's not an aftermath. It's not afterwards. You know? um, and secondly, then, then what does autonomy have to do as a decolonial project, right? So if you if you have been subjected to um, oh, Mariana, sorry to interrupt, but we've lost your mic. Have you put something over top of it, or? No. Oh, now we have back. That was. I just took off my. It could be that the this is not working. Oh, okay. <laughs> where you left me then? <laughs> where um was where you stopped listening to me? Um. It was just the beginning of your like, sentence. It was like five yeah. seconds in. Yeah. <laughs> so so how do you understand decol autonomy as a decolonial struggle, right? So so if you think of Patrick Wolf in his the way he talks about settler colonialism as having both this there's there's an eliminatory principle that's central to this type of state formation, right? And that can take on through apparently ameliorative policies like um, integration policies or multicultural policies, or it can be land dispossession and massacres, right? But um, so if you are a peoples that are the survivors of both expressions of, of genocide that's part of the Mexican state formation, then, then the act of living as a collective and of ensuring the conditions for the possibilities of the future of that collective in relationship to territory and as part of territory, then that is fundamentally political and anti-colonial. So I talk about Kuslejal politics because Kuslejal in Celtal is life existence, right? So the political, the act of, of, of engaging in politics in, is inseparable from the act of living. And that you can see, including in, I was just reading a communique that, that su comandante Moises um, published a couple of days ago where they were talking about COVID and they talk of we exist because we struggle and therefore we struggle. We struggle because we exist, right? So the existence, it's not about, I, I think it's, um, there's a fundamental intervention in how we understand the political because it's not about producing, it's about existing, right? So in, in existing and ensuring the conditions for that existence when you're survivors of genocide is, is fundamentally anti-colonial in its practice. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll um, turn to Isabel now. So Isabel, does the concept of autonomy developed by the Zapatista communities connect or resonate with indigenous communities here? So thinking of the Nishka Nation, the communities in Nunavut, uh, and the Zapotec from Huchiten, Huchiten um, with whom you've collaborated, blah, collaborated in Mexico and Canada? Um, I would say that I want to make a distinction in terms of, you know, in my comparative work, one, one thing that I have learned is that sometimes concepts don't travel easily, right? Like, you know, the concept of autonomy in Canada, um, 
when I think about it specifically with regards to the, the Nishga experience and Nunavut experience, I think about um, these arrangements, these political arrangements that have been created as a result of uh, land claims agreements in the case of, in the, case of the Nishga nation and, and, and the Inuit in Nunavut. And, and that's sort of like a form of autonomy, right? Like a, a form of autonomy that is expressed in the, within the structures of the state where these land claims open the space for self-government, for indigenous self-government and the exercise of power in different jurisdictions, right? Like, you know, uh, the, the Nishga Nation, for example, um, is, is known for having these uh, it's called sort of like a municipality plus, right? In, in terms of the, the, the jurisdictions over which it exerts some kind of power. But then I think in terms of, you know, um, that in, in Canada, uh, because of the, the ways the federal system works, municipalities are not a third level of government as in Mexico. That means then that in order to, to call something a municipal plus, it means that it goes just a little bit beyond any other municipality, not having these uh, specific land base and resources, but being dependent in, in, within the structure of the state. So, and the same happens, I, I, I would say, in the case uh, with Nunavut, we're not talking about obviously a municipality here, but rather a territory. But it's also is relevant that we are talking about the only experience in, in, or not the only, but an important experience in Canada where we're talking about indigenous territories, but not provinces, right? Like, a, you know, a territorial government Again, what is lacking in, in territorial governments is that ability to exercise power or decide over their own resources. And that's something that in both cases is a limitation. That's not necessarily the case in Mexico where municipalities have a territorial base. And sometimes they can be actually pretty large territorial bases because these municipalities can encompass a lot of different communities and which is not the case in, in Canada. So in, in that regard, I would, I would say that uh, the, the term autonomy as understood by the Zapatistas and as explain, explained by Mariana in her book is not different. I would rather think about that in terms of indigenous sovereignty, the exercise of indigenous sovereignty in Canada. In, and, and many times, you know, like in my conversations with indigenous peoples in Canada, uh, research participants and so on, whenever I would talk about political autonomy from a, a Zapatist perspective, they will tell me, you know, what that rather sounds like a sovereignty to me, right? Like that's the, that the exercise of indigenous sovereignty. So, you know, and that's, that's why I, I, I insist that in, in doing this type of comparative work, that we sort of be attentive to how the, how the concepts, different concepts cannot travel that easily, right? Like, it, I think that the concept of autonomy in Mexico has a, 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 a particular history, a political history that needs to be contextualized. And that's, that's why it has this resonance, right? When I think about the, the, the experience of the Zapotecs, particularly in Huchitan, I would say, yes, that again, this was an important political movement in the 1980s. I would say that this was sort of like a, their first uh, autonomous, indigenous autonomous municipality in the country, but again, within the structures of the state, right? Like, a, you know, exercising power, within a territorial base, but nonetheless within the, the structure of the state and participating in electoral politics and so on. And what the Zapatistas are doing or I have been doing is completely different in the sense that they are at the, with, outside of the margins of the state. And that to me is more like a, a kind of resurgence politics that is operating outside of the state, that is creating practices, political practices that are important, but that are not necessarily encapsulated within the, the, the confines of the state or the, uh, the state structures. And these to me, uh, 
is is really important you know like it, and i'm really mindful in my work when i talk about indigenous resurgence when i talk about the uh, political autonomy from a Zapatist perspective and so on and 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 that sort of like it you know that although these concepts concepts are different in different contexts we can still look at what is beneath these concepts and try to see rather in terms of the practices that we can find that are extremely important in, in both cases. Thank you, Isabel. Um, well, my the next question. Uh, to keep talking about Zapatista autonomy and the role of women in it, let's talk about the merging of economic activities with collective self-reflection and the entanglements of production, learning, pedagogy, and politics in the decision-making processes that take place in the women's production collectives. What are the everyday cultural practices that stood out to you, Mariana, and why? How do these practices extend outwards from the communities to change things outside of them? Again, a very easy question that you ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, just uh, as I, I want to reflect on that question with, with something that I, I've witnessed more recently in the rereading Isabel's work on, on indigenous women and the production of place made me rethink. But first, just as a, as, as a background. So part of what um, I, I focus on in the book is that I look at the where people, uh, scholars have uh, highlighted where it was sort of the heart of autonomy, right, in Zapatista communities with the geographical and historical political particularities that, that Isabel just pointed to. No? Um, so so the, the communities have different layers of authorities that are at the community level, at the regional level, at the municipal autonomous municipality level that have then grouped together in a caracol, which is a, a like a regional political administrative center. And so the assembly has generally been the focus of a lot of that scholarship, right? Um, the assembly where decisions are made largely in consensus, that there's a lot of deliberation on decisions. Uh, sometimes they take days, sometimes those discussions travel from the community up to the caracol and then go back down to the community. And, 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 and most of it has focused on mandar obedeciendo, so governing by obeying as a key Zapatista philosophy uh, contribution to sort of philosophical theory from str different struggles, right? Um, and and so I, I I was wondering if that was really the case from when I was doing research and and I was asking is that really the center of of autonomy or is it that perhaps there's a, a westernized assumption that a particular understanding of a public sphere which is not the assembly right but is there a translation of the public sphere as the heart of political participation? Uh, and so that's being translated. That's a, a lens through which there is understanding indigenous practices of autonomy as, as practiced in Zapatista communities. Or is there perhaps something else happening, right? So, and, and it, what is the masculinized assumption that's behind that that has to do with, pri with prioritizing liberal public spheres, right? So, so uh, I was working for, before I went back to graduate school, I, was, I worked for several years in popular education workshops with, with women, with Central and Tojolaval women that were, um, which had production collectives. So, so what appears to be on the margins of mandar obedeciendo, right? Uh, and literally in, in the case of Morelia, which is one of the, the heart of the, one of the autonomous municipalities where I worked, um, their production collectives, their vegetable garden where they would make bread, um, was literally in, in the shadows of the building where the assemblies were held, right? So they appeared to be very mundane practices because what they're, it's women that group together that, walk, that they, they're growing carrots, they're growing radishes, they're growing different vegetables for local consumption, consumption or they make bread that then gets sold in the very local community market. 
um, in between households, no? Um, but then I, I so, so I started to, to focus more on, well, what is the understandings of the political that it's emerging from these spaces that are not being um, understood as the heart of autonomy, right? Um, but for the women, they are understood as the heart of autonomy because it's the, the spaces where uh, their political formation is central. It's part of, um, as they're making, as literally toiling the soil, you know? So you're, there's a very materiality to this. You're, you're working the earth and you're also discussing and talking about your lives and you're making decisions as you're working the earth and you're sharing personal stories that are happening in your households, but also broader, um, political stories of what's happening in, in terms of broader um, the struggle with the Mexican state, et cetera, right? So, so, so in the book, I, I focus that, that there, there isn't a separation between what's production and what's reproduction, no? which I think um, uh, there isn't uh, in social reproduction activities, which is a key contribution of, of, of feminist Marxist thought that tends to create that divide. There's production on one hand, reproduction on the other, and tends to recreate the public and the private, right? As separate spheres. That's not what's going on, but there is the, this toiling of the soil to have the material necessities as, as part of cultural practices um, that, that sustain the health of households in the community. Um, there's also sometimes medicinal plants in these vegetable gardens, et cetera. And so there, again, the political is inseparable from these acts of living, right? Um, and, and so I talk about that in the book. And then when I was, and then I was thinking, well, what is that in terms of, of my second, second question of how that translates to outside of, of autonomous municipalities? And I was, and, and then I was, I was thinking of, of, uh, women's Encuentro and International Women's Encuentro that happened in March 8, 2018, so two years ago, um, in that same Caracol in 17 de Noviembre. Um, and, and it was an international women's gathering uh, where women from all, it was mestiza indigenous, uh, Afro-descendant women from the whole continent and also European women that, that came, it was several thousand people. And there was something that um, I found very disturbing about the Encuentro. And, but then I was, re I was trying to rethink what was troubling to me and ask what troubled me with new questions based on what Isabel works on in terms of the production of place uh, and indigenous women. And so the Encuentro had, it was, it was all of these women that came, they arrived in a place that is where the government authorities of the Caracol tend to meet, right? It's a large, uh, feet, it's the top of a hill. It's a large space with dorm dormitories with a lot of buildings. And so all of these women came and, and it was the first time that indigenous Zapatista women were the sole caretakers of the entire event. So the males, their male counterpart with the authorities were the ones that were you know, on the backstage, right? So they were the ones to clean the beans with, from the pebbles and wash them so they could be cooked. They were the ones that went back and forth to nearest town to, to, to get new supplies, etc. And the women were in charge of all of the logistics. Uh, the gathering had workshops, had speaking events, had poetry readings, artistic expression, music. There was a lot of activities. And, and the hosts, Tzotzil, Tojolaval, Chol, and, and Celtal women, they were from all of the Caracol, all of Zapatista territories, the five Caracoles. They were the ones that were not only participating in these events, but they cleaned the latrines, they were doing the cooking, they would clean the places where people could shower, they made sure that the coffee was done, right? And, and the thing that troubled me during the meeting is that I felt there was a lot of, a, a lot of racist reproduction of, of hegemonic feminisms. So, so uh, you would see instances where mainly mestiza and European women would critique those Zapatista women that were creating, that were making the coffee, that the coffee was cold or that the beans were, were not soft enough. I even saw a few times where they, they, they gave their suitcases to the Zapatista women to carry their suitcase to the dormitories, right? And that was, and, and, and if you think of how racism operates, part of the way that colonizing racism or, or colonialism and racism operate is that some women and their space are the scenery for others to be agents of history, right? So in that case, 
Zapatista land that used to belong to the plantations that has now is now freed land and has re been reincorporated as part of Mayan territory. And the women who were hosts were the stage onto which other women, mainly Mestiza European women, could discuss and, and be sort of the feminist movers of history, right? So that was something that was really, that really bothered me during the event. It wasn't uh, extensive, but it was very present. And so then when I was reading Isabel's work, I, I re-asked questions onto that that troubled me. And I said, okay, that, that's evident, but what, what's the intervention that, that the Zapatista women hosts were making onto the political? What were they telling us, right? And it wasn't that cleaning the latrines and cooking the coffee is the context onto which verbal particip political participation could happen. It was the political act itself. It's not the context. It's at the level of verbal discussion and participation and at the level of the workshops and at the level of the, the music and the dancing and the artistic production, right? Because all of that was taking place on land that again is a reincorporation of Mayan territory um, and a taking back from what had been dispossessed. It was literally the, the Casa Grande, the house of the plantation owner was in that space of land, right? So, so what is um, transformative is these caretaking roles that again is not that it was taken out of the private and put into the public, that it's part of, of, of how you make politics inseparable of whether it's private or public spaces. And that, and that that was, and it's an expression of dignity that you can create a well-being for a collective and take care of that entire collective as part of the political discussions and as part of political transformation. And I think that that's what was trying to be conveyed by Zapatista women and, and sort of the reascription of racism and these colonial logics were not making that visible. And I think that that expression of the way you create a, a radical interdependent caretaking, right? Um, where social reproduction is part of it. And I'm not, I'm not liking those two concepts, but I haven't quite come up with other concepts. I think that's fundamentally um, important in a context such as the pandemic, no? Or the context of extreme violence in Mexico, where ensuring the well-being and the survival of the collective is, is what holds at bay the forced disappearance, the feminicides, this machinery of death that we're up against. Isabel, would you like to respond to the, the conversation that um, Mariana set up towards your work? Um, I, I think it, I would, um... I would sort of, you know, connect it with some of the, um, some of the, what I have seen also in Canada in the sense that I feel like it, the indigenous women have developed uh, similar spaces, spaces of reflection, learning and politics. And that is very different from, um, from the ways in which uh, non-indigenous feminists have talked about you know indigenous women uh what mariana was describing about what bothers what bothers you in in this event is you know to me it's sort of like a replication of what we have seen in terms of the tensions between indigenous women and and non-indigenous feminists that are always assuming that are above things or they they are the actors of these spaces um and it also makes me think that um, part of it has also to do with the fact that we, we usually think about indigenous women as not being knowledge holders, as, as not being capable of producing knowledge, as not being capable of producing politics or engaging in politics. And, and in a lot of the work that has been done for many, many, many years, this tiny expressions of politics were not even considered political, right? Like these activities were seen as social reproduction, as building communities, but we, it's, it's not their problem, it's our problem as scholars that we are not able to perceive that as a political act. It's our problem because we are ill-equipped 
to see what constitutes the political, that we continue to operate with conceptions of the political that are incapable of seeing politics in the everyday life. And that's what I think that indigenous women are bringing into, into conversations today. That is a type of politics that happens in the everyday life, in intimate relations, in relationships with each other, that happens in the, in the doing, right? Like when I think about many of the different, uh, different uh, spaces, for, for instance, in, in Canada, when I think about the tiny houses warriors, when I think about the reproductive justice and body sovereignty by the native youth and sexual health network or when i think about the beating uh re reclamation of beating or high tanning all of these different projects are about politics are about sort of the doing specific activities that are performed in the everyday that are performed with a, as a as a pedagogical and as a political act, right? Like that's, there is something to be taught. There is something to be learned from these um, very mundane, mundane activities, if you wish, but that are extremely political, you know, reclaiming beating as a sovereign act. What could be more political than that? Reclaiming tanning, high tanning, what could be more political political than that. And it's not just the activity of, you know, the high tanning, but everything that is behind it. To get to that point, there was a hunting process. There was something that women were involved, that supported. It's about the community, what happens within the community. And in, 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 in the case that you, Mariana, were, were talking about, that these women were making the coffee, that they were cleaning. Well, you know, it takes a community to actually receive thousands of people coming from other places and the logistics to, to do that. I, you know, I, 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 you know, if we saw these other people coming from outside engaging in something like that, I would see whether or not their beans will be well cooked or their coffee will be cold. You know, and that's just to tell you that that in itself to me is speaks of the I, the responsibility that that po the political is um, is part of, right? Look at the, in these indigenous women in sort of embodying their own respons responsibility of hosting all these people. They be were becoming these political subjects. Right? They were these political subjects receiving people in the territory and taking care of these people in their territory. Whether or, no the, or not these guests were able to reciprocate that, that's a different discussion. But that they did what they needed to do in order for those uh, meetings and for those events to happen, they did that. And that's sort of like a, a, an expression of that type of responsibility and reciprocity that we see in indigenous women's politics and that I've been sort of talking in my own work, that we need to start thinking about indigenous women's politics and, in, and what indigenous women know in different ways that don't continue to replicate our lack of tools in terms of talking about what constitutes the political, I think. Thank you, Isabel and Madagana. That was really, really lovely. Um, uh, Fabi, you're the next question. Yes, well, thank you. This is extremely interesting. Um, I am originally from Peru. So Mariana, when I got to the section in your book, when uh, you argue that um, ethnicity is an insufficient concept to account for the social injustices in Latin America, that kind of a strike chord for me. Mm. Um, so what do you think are the implications and what is the political necessity to, to switch from ethnicity to the concept of race? I think you have touched already a little bit with your previous answer, but I'm, I'm curious about it. Well, I, um, yes, thank you. And, and I think Peru dialogues very well with Mexico in terms of, of, of that. 
way of mestizaje operating in, in or in Brazil with a racial democracy, right? So the way that that race is something of the colonial past, and once you're in a post-colonial present, then it's not about race because race is about violence, race is about um, elimination, and, misty, and ethnicity is about inclusion, it's about integration, it's about uh, modernity, right? It's about the possibility of forging. Um, and, and that the problems of race and racism are something that the US, United States has as a problem, and, but it's not something that's north, that's south of the border. And if you export those concepts, then you are being imperialist, right? <laughs> that, that's the way that it gets discarded. And I think that, well, um, ethnicity, right, which, which focuses on difference as something that's culturally based does not account for territorial dispossession and the perpetuation of territorial dispossession, nor does it account for the way that, that Latin American nation states are, are profoundly racialized in the sense that the social orderings uh, operate with Europeanness and the progressive whitening of that which does not succumb to Europeanness. Is, is considered as that which is valued and everything else gets pushed down in a series of, of levels of inferiorization, you know? So I think that um, if you, if you and, and I think that, um, and my discipline as anthropology has been profoundly implicated in reproducing that, that alterity in Latin America is based on ethnicity, that is to say it's based on cultural difference. Uh, it's based on language, it's based on cultural practices, it's based on dress, but it's not based on racialized injustices. No? Um, and, and so I think that, that the ac academia um, has been profoundly complicit in, in rendering invisible um, the impacts of the perpetuation of territorial dispossession and of the way that there's uh, inherent attributes associated with cultural practices, uh, which bi biologize and thus racialize them, right? Uh, so, so I think of it, um, for example, like I think of, of, of Bluthart's book, right? Of red skin, white mask. And I think of his critique of a politics of recognition, that a politics of recognition is largely based on cultural alterity. No, um, and on multiculturalism, for example, right? Uh, and and what are the limits of a politics of recognition? Um, when they, can you get to racialized justices and the reinstate the reinstating territory to to um, to native peoples through a politics of recognition, or does that just perpetuate in the case of Latin America mestizoness at the center? with the aggregates of indigenous peoples and, and Afro-descendant peoples on the margins, right? Um, and to what extent is a politics of recognition, which is Bluthart's argument, um, continues to operate on, on the, the structures of colonialism. It's not, it's not changing the niches onto which indigenous peoples and Afro-descendant peoples are, are continually being pushed and have to perpetually struggle against you now as a countercurrent to what social forces and state forces are pushing them into specific niches. So, so analytically, I think that it's fundamental to talk about racism and to talk about processes of racialization in Latin America because it opens a lens to talk about what isn't discussed in the way that oppression and, and exploitation operate in society. Um, and I think that, that politically, for that reason, it's, it's a necessity. Uh, I, I think that, that, that academia or social scientists have um, uh, multiple blind spots. One of which I already talked about is, is the complicity of not talking about racialized injustices in Latin America. But a second is that if, if indigenous people or Afro-descendant peoples are not talking about racism, if they're not using the category racism, they're not talking about the effects of racism in their lives and in the lives of their communities, right? And I think that's the second 
uh, analytical blind spot that we have in academia because people are talking about racism all the time, but they're just not talking about it in the terms that we're told as social scientists to identify, oh, there's a talk about racism. And if they're not using racism, then there's there's a false consciousness because they're talking about class or they're talking, they're not understanding the level of their oppression, right? So I think that we have, um, a, a profound challenge as social scientists to take away those blind spots and 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 to listen to the ways the profound ways that 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 um, that communities are talking about the the dehumanizing effects and the perpetuation of the disposability of their land of their bodies of their knowledge of their livelihoods that that sustains Latin American states. Right and sustain societies uh, in Latin America, and and I think that that's um, and that's I think that that's that's a, a need that we need to have, and and I'm saying that as as a light skinned mestiza from Mexico City that sees that as a political project. That if I'm not engaging in that conversation, then I'm perpetuating the structures that position me in a situation of privilege in relationship to indigenous communities and Afro-Mexican communities. So, so that's, I think that that's at the heart of some, a lot of the work that I do. I think that- um, Thank you. Yes, Isabel, I was wondering if you have any further- Yeah. Um, yeah matter. Yes. I think it's, uh, you know, like a, what I share with Mariana, this idea that how, you know, useless ethnicity becomes, and you know, as an indigenous person and as an indigenous academic, it has always bothered me in, in the sense that to start with, because this is a concept that was created by anthropologists to talk about indigenous peoples, right? Based on a set of, um, set of criteria or attributes that they could deem observable, right? That, you know, my language, my clothing, my food, my cultural practices and so on, but it's always sort of like a, the way others would see indigenous peoples, the way others would consider what was relevant to define my, my being indigenous. And that always didn't, didn't necessarily resonate with my experiences. Some of the attributes that anthropologists maybe thought was important to Zapotecs in the, in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec were not even, we, we didn't even think about those things, right? Like as being, essential to who we are you know they they didn't necessarily engage with other more important things in terms of you know the practices that makes a community a community or or the relationships of solidarity and care and you know reciprocity that make communities what they are or or our own uh, origin stories and, and so on. Many other things that didn't necessarily resonate with the term ethnicity. And definitely I agree uh, with Mariana that the term ethnicity somehow it com conveys the, the idea that indigenous peoples are just ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities that are for whatever reason in disadvantage with the rest of the of the population in, in in Latin America, and what is missing in that is that that historical history of colonialism. But it's not just the the, the history, right? Like because I don't think that in Latin America, um, colonialism is a, just a thing of the past. To me, like the modern national state replicated colonialism, the post-colonial state, and I use quotation marks, sort of reinserted a neo-colonial regime that was fundamented in the in the devaluation and the dehumanization of indigenous people's bodies and that we were sort of represented as the being poor, as being illiterate, as being sort of like a, the people that just, uh, you know, needed to be uh, always intervening with our lives in, 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 in order to transform us into something else. And that's sort of like a current in, in, in the history of the modern state in Latin America. This idea that 
always, you know, like the stereotypical assumptions that create a, a set of problems in the sense that whoever then becomes educated, they take that uh, indigeneity away from them, right? Like a, in, in that sense. Or whoever has lost their language for whatever reason, they take that indigeneity away from them. And that's a problem that, con that the replicate is this colonial, this colonial mentality and this colonial power and domination where indigeneity and indigenous peoples are, if not the only sort of, you know, the only groups of people, groups of nations that have always, always been attempted to be eliminated, attempted to be assimilated, attempted to be reduced in numbers, attempted to be transformed into something else. You know, I, I don't necessarily know of any other group or category of people that have suffered as much in terms of indi as indigenous peoples in, in terms of taking that sort of identity, taking that history away from them. And definitely the term ethnicity does that, you know, in a very elegant way, if you wish, in a very intellectual way, but takes away that fundamental history of colonialism. You know, and, and, and that's sort of like a, what is complicated. And then, yes, in this context of, uh, of a neoliberal state, we can talk about indigeneity, you know, like the, as, as, as you were mentioning, Mariana, in, in Kutar's book, you know, like the politics of recognition. Again, what is it that is being recognized? It's a very fixed understanding of indigeneity that is extremely difficult to be indigenous in those terms because it's something that I'm not. It's something that I will never be and I never been. It is an idea, again, an idea of this white settler state. And, and I'm saying this because I think that, that that notion of this also travels to other countries. You know, when we talk about this global governance and how indigeneity is recognized, it is not just in settler space that we continue to operate with these fixed understandings of indigeneity. In my own work, I sort of, I sort of tra have traced how this sort of disseminates and be, is adopted in other countries as this understanding of indigeneity or meaning of indigeneity that needs to be recognized. But that indigenous peoples every single time will, will fail to be indigenous in those terms because that's not what indigeneity is. That's not what defines me as an indigenous person, right? And again, you know, besides race, it's also the conversation about how neocolonialism continued to operate in, 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 in Mexico and most Latin American countries. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. We're, uh, the next question is going to be a two-parter. I'm going to ask the first question and then David will ask the second question. So it's a bit longer. Um, so bear with me. Um, uh, ontological arguments within critical race studies have become more popular. In my estimation, these arguments tend to reify juridical categories of the racialized subject rather than to question them, an issue that stymies attempts to build solidarity across different and stratified racialized communities. I'm thinking specifically of Jared Sexton and Frank Wilderson and the inf their influence on Afro-pessimisms um, as a mode of ontology. Comparatively, your work fo focuses on knitting together histories of subjection. How has the state put pressure on communities and how the how have the communities grown in response to that pressure, transforming their biopolitical constraints? How does this approach allow us to make connections with other indigenous communities? And at the same time, um, can you speak a little on the solidarity work of the Zapatistas, such as the invitation of the Ayotzinapa family members to the Festival of World Resistance or the October 5th communique? Um, what is the role of the academic in extending or supporting Indigenous solidarity work? Because it's a big question. Um, but that's for Mariana and David will ask a similar one for uh, Isabel shortly. Yeah, that's a packed question again. <laughs> and you know, when I read it, I was, uh, I, I was um, 
thinking of what I consider to be one of the main deficiencies of my book, um, which is that I don't place in dialogue indigenous struggles with, with black struggles and with black liberation, with la black liberation struggles specifically. Um, even though I'm, I'm, I'm versed in those struggles, I was focusing much more on indigeneity when in fact there's political interventions that the Zapatistas are made that, that dialogue profoundly with black liberation struggles and with black diaspora and black critical thought. No? So I want to sort of answer that question because it has political implications. Um, and then and then move a little bit from there. So so one of the ways that that I think and, and it's actually something that um, I'm now working on an article that's trying to place that dialogue because um, because there is this gap in the book. And so one of it has to do with the way that the the theorizing of structures of power of the finca in in the cañadas de la selva la candona. So in the Lacanon jungle, the plantation system, how that dialogues with, uh, with critical race theories that have looked at the plantation system and, and the enslavement of African peoples as, as fundamental to the workings of, of world capitalism and as that which pushes forward modern state formation. You know? So there's a lot that has been done that, that focuses on the history of the plantations in the Caribbean, um, in, in, in the United States, in Brazil, and, and the dialogues very much so with, with um, Zapatista's understandings of power through, through the, the finca and how you can look at the neoliberal state by understanding how the finca um, created these dehumanizing conditions and this and perpetuated uh, territorial dispossession. So, so I think, and, and it was a blind spot of my own when I did my work, but I think it was a blind spot in part because the Zapatistas are not to have very rarely dialogued with black liberation struggles. Um, even though there has been attempts, um, especially from, from black activists in the United States to, to create those dialogues. No, so, so I think that that that's um, you can't if you understand that colonialism begins by creating these categories in part by creating these categories of race, right? Where where African bodies are located and where indigenous bodies are located, and that has to do with enslavement and it has to do with territorial dispossession, then. For, no matter how much you struggle for indigenous autonomy in Zapatista territory, you're not going to have liberation if you're not engaging with the liberation of Afro-descendant communities in, in, in Mexico and in Latin America. No? Um, so I feel that, that, that that's, that's, um, that's a, something that has politically unresolved in, in the Zapatista struggle over a quarter century. I think there's a political imperative even more so now that, that um, um, Afro-Mexican communities have been recognized and are demanding recognition, first by the Mexican state, um, but that have been demanding recognition um, as political actors and as part of the Mexican state. Uh, I think that the second question is then, well, what's my role as an academic, as a mestiza academic in that dialogue? Is that not a place for me to play or rather um, is it something that I, I need to engage with, but actually my role is where, where um, how, how to question the way that mestizaje as an ideology continues to locate certain sectors of the population in positions of privilege and what are the ways that um, theoretically and politically I need to be undermining that. You know? um, and, and, and that combination is what generates the possibility for forging political alliances in, in aspects that have been extremely deficient in Mexico. Uh, I think that there's still um, an mm -hmm. arrogance of, of mestizo activists when, when they travel to, I'm, th I'm talking specifically of Zapatista communities, but I could talk of other places. Um, almost as, as perpetuating this notion of me, my Indians, right? As if they were, there's an ownership and an entitlement 
to a political struggle that you are being included into, but it's not yours by default. It's one that you need to, to be recognized through your own practices. And the, I think that there's a generalized feeling of entitlement that continues to be part of this machinery um, that doesn't allow and that breaks any possibility of political alliances across ethnic racialized differences in the country. Thank you, Mariana. Um, now, I'm just picking up on what you were mentioning around alliances and solidarity. Um, Isabel, uh, please, um, if you may, um, share with us your knowledge and experiences with First Peoples communities in Canada. How do they build alliances with other communities? Um, and how are Indigenous ontologies different from some of the other ontologies in critical race studies? Okay, that's a complicated question. <laughs> You guys have been asking like a really difficult questions, but um, I'll try. Um, I think I, I first I want to say that um, I find the term solidarity a little bit problematic, right? Because this is idea that non-Indigenous peoples, for example, can uh, somehow come and join me in my struggles or Indigenous people's struggles in a very individualized way, right? That th somehow they are supporting. And I think it is better to talk about alliances and core resistance in the sense that, that we are sort of being affected by, by a system, by an economic system that is destroying the environment, that is uh, producing a set of negative outcomes and impacts for black communities and indigenous peoples, but for other peoples differently, very differently, but that nonetheless affect us all. And, you know, I think that when I, you know, when I think about movements in Canada, such as Idle No More, that's to me one of the things that I think about, this idea of co-resistance. And I want to connect that in terms of some of the practices that we witness about this in the sense that um, I don't think that I don't know more, for example, as a, as a movement was operating with uh, be, or outside of these indigenous ontologies. I think it, it was pretty much embedded in these indigenous ontologies, political ontologies in the sense that it was a particular way of seeing the world, a particular way of understanding this movement, movement at, at, at one point in, in, in Canada and continues to be in the sense that, um, you know, there, it was a movement similar to the Zapatista, where there wasn't any particular leadership or, or central or visible, but it was a little bit more diffuse, right? Like, in, 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 you know, that it operated differently and it sort of uh, engaged in practices such as round dances and, you know, mobs and, you know, all of these different expressions that happened that to me was not necessarily about, you know, some of the people that have analyzed this movement say that the, the, these were one way of attracting the attention of non-Indigenous Canadians. I would disagree. I think that these were political practices that have the, the, the purpose of uniting or bringing together the Indigenous peoples that have been divided by the colonial state that have been dismembered as a result of the colonial practices of the colonial state, that were, were the, these political alliances have been difficult because they have been sort of, you know, all of these different nations have been divided and separated to make really difficult that pro this process of unity and alliances. And to me, a lot of the, the political expressions of Idle No More were sort of pointing to this idea of remembering these nations or bringing this international, and I want to use that term, you know, in, 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 not, in not the domesticated understanding of international relations, but the, these nations as being nations and bringing them into international alliances. And this speaks of a history of indige an indigenous history in Turtle Island. 
world diplomacy and uh, alliances and partnerships existed prior to colonization. And, you know, and in that sense, I guess co-resistance is a better term to think about this, all of these nations engaging into international relations and supporting each other. When I think about Nodapal, for example, and all of these different in, uh, indigenous representatives from different parts of the world are coming and supporting this movement. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm reminding of these international relations, indigenous international relations. And that to me, that's embedded in this in these indigenous ontologies is sort of embodying nationhood, this embodying this indigenous sovereignty that is expressed in these political practices that to me are extremely important. And in, in within that, you know, beyond these international indigenous relations, now what we are seeing or we have been seeing as well is sort of like a, these attempts to engage into different kinds of conversations with movements like Black, uh, Black Lives Matter and you know, like the struggles of Black communities that have become central, that definitely is not a, is not a conversation about who has suffered the most, but rather about how colonialism has sort of affected these, these two different uh, set of communities differently. And from there, what kinds of possibilities, political possibilities exist for the future for co-resisting uh, sort of uh, this colonial power that continues to exist in Canada, in the US, but also in Latin America. These attempts in Latin America happened in, in, in the early 1990s with the 500 years of indigenous resistance where, you know, indigenous peoples were basically uh, together, walking together with Afro-descendant communities that after that ended up being separated and going in different directions. But these attempts have existed in the past. And that is important to sort of uh, start to excavate these, these histories and try to see what possibilities exist there and, and from where we can start sort of learning what, what worked and what didn't and what are the new possibilities today for engaging in different processes of co-resistance and, and alliances and international, indigenous international relations. Yeah, I think the, um, looking at those examples is a really important way of, you know, reimagining the future. I think you're so right. Uh, thank you so much both for those really wonderful um, answers. We're, uh, we're going to ask you one more question from Alejandra, and then we'd like to um, thank you both for um, your wonderful um, talks today. Um, so Alejandra, feel free to um, ask your question. Yes, it's a other long question, sorry for that, but... <laughs> Uh, for us, as a PhD student, it's so important to do it. So, Mariana, your book reflects on how the naivete and the good intentions of the researcher can become part of a colonizing mission. There is an urgent need for researchers to develop alternative attachment to their research and, the, and research subjects by practicing other kinds of knowledge production. We notice that your research is grounded in, in praxis and engages Latin American thinkers, such as Freire, Quijano, Falsborda, Cumes, Gonzalez, Casanova, and puts that work into conversation with Foucault and Negri, as well as Zapatista elders and community members. Your methodology incorporates a reflexive process of listening and reformulating of learning and unlearning of back and forth dialogues. Can you talk a little about how your ability to move between these distinctive disciplines, epistemologies and practices allow you to develop a politically committed research methodology and how this allows you to act 
from within new political imaginaries of liberation. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see, in a succinct way. <laughs> well, I first, I first, I think that we need to recognize that that um, that academic knowledge production and knowledge production in general is is profoundly political and inherently political. No? So, so if I was a, when I started graduate school and before graduate school. If I was engaged in, in supporting Zapatista community struggles for autonomy, um, then how I was producing knowledge on that struggle for autonomy is part of the struggle for autonomy, right? Um, and, and for that very reason, uh, and I think it had to do in part with my graduate training, um, I decided, I, I recognized that, that how I did research had to be an object of analysis. It wasn't just the process through which I would get the results, but in itself, I needed to be analyzing. And that required analyzing myself and not who, as I, who I am as Mariana Mora, but who I represent within broader structures of power, right? Um, and, and, and that had a political intentionality because the, the, because autonomy is not just about changing relationships of power to the state, it's also about changing relationships of power to mestizos, to Afro-Mexicans, to everyone else in society. So if I was going to be um, supporting a struggle for autonomy in part through a type of activist research, then I needed to necessarily see what were the interactions that were happening, right? Um, but I, I, I think what's what was, uh, and, and from that I drew from, from decolonial feminist uh, research trajectories in which uh, feminist native scholars are our central component no? um, and, uh, of, of critiquing the, the extractivist logics of social science research in general. So, uh, and, and all of, so, so from those, from, from that I, I had this, this uh, self-critique that I was constantly questioning myself and my role, um, not to look at my myself, but rather through the interactions, right? Um, so it wasn't to put the lens back onto myself. And and there I think what was, was central was not so much my own critique and my own self-reflection, but rather the way that the Zapatista communities and Zapatista authorities um, appropriated the research and transformed the methods and the methodologies and thus the results, right? So I want to focus more on that. And, and I think that sometimes we tend to, to associate methods as techniques of research, right? As if they were, they were tools, like a toolbox. But I think that uh, method is profoundly um, centered on a series of epistemological assumptions and is therefore also very political. It's not a series of toolbox it's not a series of techniques to be used, right? And so, I, and, and I think that that became very evident in, in, in the research itself. Um, uh, the, the, what I describe in the book is the way that the Zapatista community members decided that, the, that the, the interviews that I had proposed, first there needed to be discussions in all of the assemblies. They reviewed the questions, they, prac they had had practice sessions before speaking with me which was in essence, not a practice session. It was a way of, of using those questions as part or inserting those questions as part of broader forms of political formation because I was asking about the history. I was asking about autonomy. I was asking about the time of the Fincas. I was asking about the past. So they became excuses for intergenerational dialogues that were already being had. Certainly my research did not generate those conversations. It just added to those. No? Um, and, and so there was a displacement of myself as, as a researcher. And, and what I think is a really profound anti-colonial methodological intervention that Zapatista community members made, which isn't in the book. It's something that I had thought about later. So I think that one of the ways that we, there's a series of presuppositions mm -hmm. that operate in social science research. And one of those is that there's already pre-existing knowledge that's in someone's head or in someone's body or in someone's experience. 
And then you need to just figure out what's the right technique, the right type of question, the right type of setting to ask those questions so those answers can be conveyed, right? Which is profoundly extractivist in its logic because there's already this raw material that's in someone's head and you just need to figure out how you ask the right way so you can extract it, right? And then you systematize, you analyze it, you convert it into theory. Um, and, and so, what I think what the Sabatista community members questions in the way that they manipulated, and I mean manipulated in a positive way, in that they molded the research, right? They, they put their hands into it and they turned it into something else, uh, is that they questioned that assumption. It isn't that there's pre-existing information that one is trying to get at as a social scientist. It's rather in what ways is, is research which produces knowledge, how does that create a space for collective knowledge production to be engaged with, you know? So that a series of people come into a collective setting with their, with their understandings, with their life experiences, with intergenerational memories, right? Yes, but that they come out of that research experience understanding themselves in time and space as a collective in slightly different ways, you know? um, Which profoundly changes what's the role of research and where is the knowledge? Is the knowledge something pre-existing or is research the process of research, not the product of research, is the process of research generating knowledge, right? As a collective that allows one to strengthen and to shift and to figure out how to maneuver as part of broader struggles, right? So their insistence on the fact that, that interviews is needed to be collective their insistence on decentering my role in the interviews and having the facilitator of, of, of them be the main person, of having a whole series of discussions that had nothing to do with my specific questions and redirecting it had to do in, in the, with this understanding that collective knowledge production, the research can form part of collective knowledge production as part of a process, no? not as the end result. Uh, and I think that that also is, is a, a key intervention in the genealogies of participatory action research or collaborative research in Latin, in the different genealogies of Latin America that tends to think you do research, you find the res results of the research and then you do something with it, right? Um, but here they're saying, no, it's, it's a constant back and forth. It's not that you wait until you have the results of your research, is it the process itself, it's, what's generating the shifting in a political practice as a collective that allows us to continue struggling. You know? uh, so, so, so I think that that, that is um, a fundamental intervention that then adds us to rethink methods, not only as a series of tools, but as a series of, of epistemological interventions. And then it, uh, it makes, it opens up a whole series of possibilities of how do you engage in research, uh, not expecting the final results, but as part of this process that's producing struggle uh, or knowledge intersubjectively as a collective through struggle, right? Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Um, we were really, I was really into this, um, the, idea, the themes of the political stakes of the, of the method. Um, Isabel, we, I wanted to turn it to you if you have any responses or thoughts on uh, Mariana's uh, method. Well, I think that that's um, a lot of the what uh, indigenous scholars have been advocating for for a very long time in terms of how, in this case, anthropologists, but many others do research with indigenous peoples in the sense that there, there needs to be a shift from the researcher as being the one who knows, the one who asks the questions and then goes into these communities and extracts all this information and takes it away and puts it in a book and, and, and that's it, right? Um, I think a, a, a lot of the, uh, you know, Linda Smith and many, many, many others, uh, Margaret Kobach and, you name it, there are many uh, indigenous scholars that have been uh, saying that there needs to be a different way of engaging indigenous communities. In, uh, com indigenous communities are knowledge holders. And as knowledge holders, that means presupposes that researchers are not the most important 
you know, in the process. But rather, like Mariana was saying, this is a process of co-producing knowledge. That knowledge is co-producing the process. It, it, it is not there just to be excavated, but rather to be co-produced and co-interpreted in the process of doing research. And engaging uh, with these um, indigenous communities in, through their own protocols, you know? And, and I'm especially, uh, you know, appreciative of the fact that when, when we're doing uh, research with indigenous communities, I think that in Mexico and in many other Latin American uh, countries, we as communities, as indigenous communities, part of members of indigenous communities, we need to start sort of having a better control of the research process in, in the ethics process, not just um, asking our uh, universities to grant us that et ethics uh, approval to go and do research, but actually to demand that researchers engage in an ethics conversation with indigenous communities in how they are going to conduct that research. And that's sort of, you know, I appreciate about your book, Mariana, in that this, you know, informally or formally, you went through that, right? Like the, the, that process of, you know, being scrutinized, your research being scrutinized because that needs to be, research is about accountability too, right? Like, you know, I, in my case, doing research in my own community or the region that I come from, I want to go back to my community and people not looking at me like, a, we don't want you here for doing, saying what you're doing or doing that kind of research that you shouldn't be doing, right? Or even like the own my own questions to me is even like the kinds of questions that I ask have to do with what is important to my community, what is important to my family, uh, family members who are experiencing, you know, the impact of resource extraction or who are going through different processes as a result of uh, these impacts and so on. You know, I think it even from the start, from the kinds of questions and topics we engage, we sort of we we sort of need to start doing research that matters to, to indigenous communities that are relevant to them, not to build an academic career, I think, but rather that are relevant to these communities. Ah, wonderful. Thank you both so much um, for your time and your generosity today. I think you've really affirmed um, the sort of political stakes of our research and the continuing necessity for us to be asking ourselves very difficult questions and to be recentering uh, indigenous sovereignty and autonomy movements uh, in, our, um, uh, in our practices and in our, in our thinking. I'd just like uh, to plug uh, both of the books um, here today. So here is Isabel's uh, Indigenous Encounters with Neoliberalism, which I encourage you to pick up. And of course, Mariana's uh, Kushihal Politics, um, which you can uh, purchase uh, online anywhere, I assume, probably not from Amazon. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, yes, um, please join us in thanking Mariana and Isabel. And if, you, if anyone who's been watching has any questions or comments, um, please don't hesitate to share them with us on our Facebook page, and we will make sure that both the speakers today gets them. Um, you can find that at um, uh, facebook.com slash sji.gsa. And um, so please join us in, in thanking these two. Um, thank you for having and, us. Yes, yeah. our, our next session will be in about a month. Make sure you don't miss it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Bye. Mm -hmm.